And it was very exciting to see the hunger and thirst that people had for gossiping about books. Mm -hmm. And that's what books are for. Mm -hmm. They're for gossiping about. Gossiping. That's the reason book clubs work. Because you're yep. going to go gossip and chat about the book and you're going to gossip about life. Welcome to Book Reporter Talks to where our interview guest today is Jacqueline Bouchard, and we are going to be talking about her latest novel, The Good Son, which is a book that propels a lot of discussion ideas, and I think would be a great book club selection. I'm going to suggest it to my book club. It's a book reporter bets on selection as well, and you know that those are the books that I'm betting you'll love, and I just want you to pick up and trust me and go read them. So welcome, Jacqueline. So nice to have you here today. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm so, really, I really appreciate it. So let's start by you telling us about The Good Son. You give us your description. This is a very controversial book, and I'll tell you why. When the idea for it was handed to me by someone to whom a version of it actually happened, we were standing in a coffee line at a big writers conference. I think it was, uh, Maybe it was American Library Association. I can't remember because this is some years ago. And the woman in front of me dropped her book. I picked it up and handed it back to her. And I said, ah, you know, are you here for the writer's conference? No, she said, I come every weekend to visit my son. He's only 19. He's in prison nearby here. And he will be for a long time because he killed the only girl he ever loved. They were sweethearts since the seventh grade. and. He was so messed up on drugs. He doesn't even remember the event, but he thought that she was something else, not his girlfriend. Oh, wow. I was stunned. I didn't, I wanted to run away, but instead we sat there and talked and a version of another scene in the book, very different. It's very different in the book. Uh, she told me about going to the cemetery to put roses on the girl's grave and the girl's mother showed up mm -hmm. and she was terrified, mm -hmm. but they ended up, they had been neighbors and they ended up basically crying in each other's arms. And the girl's mother said, you are luckier because at least you can touch him, even though he's going to be in prison for 20 years. And, uh, and when I told my agent, I wanted to write a novel about this, he said, Wow, Jackie, I have one word for you. No. <laughs> and I know your agent, so I can picture that. No. <laughs> no. And um, he, he said no one in this book could ever be sympathetic. Mm -hmm. But to me, they already were sympathetic. They were already people who I loved every one of them, despite their flaws. Mm -hmm. And so I said, I can do this. And now he agrees with me. Yeah. No, I agree with you completely. I think there's also a word there to all writers of talk to everybody at the conference, even those that are not attending, because right. you never know where you're going to get your ideas from. And it's uh. true. Sometimes you talk to somebody and you hear about their life and you hear about whatever. And if you didn't do that thing, like here's the book you dropped or whatever, never would have happened. Never would have. I know. I, I know. I say, I wish I could find her because the artist's privilege, of course, is to correct life. Right, to reshape right. it the way you want it. And I, I wish I knew who she was and, and I could find her or something so that I could tell her about this. I'm sure she doesn't know, but it, I was running down the aisle to give my speech. They were introducing me. That's how long I stayed with her. Wow. I just couldn't look away. Yeah. Her story, the grief was so majestic. And while you create grief on the page, that was raw grief. That was it, like her just giving her emotion. And to be able to capture that and figure out what's going on is, it, it's just, it takes you to another level because you're feeling what she's feeling while you're sitting there. And I don't think she had ever told anyone this story in that way before. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to so badly. So the book opens with Thea at the prison gates waiting to pick up Stefan, um, her son. And it's a brilliant what I'm calling the cold open, like television, cold open with this line. I was picking my son up at the prison gates when I spotted the mother of the girl he had murdered. Okay, and you go on to say two independent clauses, 10 words each, joined by an adverb, 
made up entirely of words that would once have been unimaginable to think, much less say. Brilliant opening. Were those the first lines you wrote or did you get back and do those later? Yeah, it's the first lines I wrote. But I sweat blood over my opening sentences. And it can take me a full month or even longer to come up with the perfect opening sent a sentence. And, and with it, you know what you want to do, right? You know, you want to convey who the main players are and some, um, some sense of their personalities. And in that, those opening sentences, in those two sentences, what you really learn is that the is something about the mother of the girl that was murdered. Why is she there at six o'clock on a winter morning? OK, something about Thea. And then in the second sentence, you learn who Thea is. She's an English professor. Mm -hmm. Right. And right, so right. that conveys everything. OK, these are your players. You know, this is what you're going to need to know about them. Right. And that's all you're going to know up front. And then it's going to go on from there. Like that's this is this is your right. you're, we're right. setting the stage. We're setting the stage and what's going on. So Stefan comes home and he's clearly not the son that went away. He's three years older, but he's also living in fear. He's got a lot of fear around him. He needs to reacclimate to life outside prison. And he's anxious, fearful, has issues with sleeping. You bring up a lot of things that you don't really think about. You think about somebody coming out of prison. You see the pictures on the news. Somebody comes out of prison, they're joyful, but you don't realize what's going to happen when they go home, get dry in a routine. Did you interview prisoners that were out already or people that were in to see how you get that emotion across of them? I interviewed a couple of mothers who had sons in prison. Mm. I don't know their names. I don't know whether they even told me the truth because they were linked to me by other people who, and then I talked to them on the phone, but the authenticity of what they said was clear. And one of them was the kind of, had the, she said, I have a, uh, he was a good son, but he was not a good boy. And it was almost a foregone conclusion that he would go to prison at some point. That was almost a, uh, a sort of uh, focus for esteem among his peers. Mm -hmm. And then I talked to a woman who was very much like Thea, for whom having this ordinary boy, football player, um, you know, good, you know, not great, but good student, good boy, go to prison was a bomb in their lives and a bomb in their small community. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, the, that. And also for a hundred years, I was a newspaper reporter and I had been to prison, not as a inmate, mm -hmm. but it really feels like it mm -hmm. when you go to prison to interview someone and that door shuts behind you, it is a feeling so harrowing that if you haven't had it, you cannot imagine it because you believe that when you get in there, they're going to find out you did something wrong and they're not going to let you leave. Wow. And it is the atmosphere inside prison. So many people told me it's not really the lack of freedom so much as the lack of privacy. Mm -hmm. that you're never alone. People are always crying and singing and whispering and chattering and uh, the lights are never off. They're dimmed, but it's never really dark. So you're never really alone. You never have any solitude at all. And that's what really works away at your mind. And further, when you come out of prison, it's you know, everybody knows Rita Hayworth and the Shawshank Redemption, the movie, The Shawshank Redemption. Um, and it, it was very clear on the fact that people who come out of prison, that's the worst time, the most dangerous time for them in terms of whether they're going to be able to ever have, they can't go back to the life they had before. That life is over. And at some point, that's at the point that many of them reoffend mm -hmm. to go back to something familiar or they take their own lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there, there's so many angles of what happens, you know, it's like that prison rehabilitation once people get out of helping people reacclimate. And it's so much of what's not done. And, you know, we've been talking a lot in New York about a lot of crime that's happening and what's happening. And people are going in, they're coming out. It's like, it's like jail is like a revolving door of people coming in and out. And there's no real re rehabilitation happening. It's just, you're out, you're gone. Yeah. Right. And um, supposedly you have some skills. Supposedly you have some you have a, a little money and some clothing, but you have no context. 
The world has, even if it's been two years, the world, imagine what the world was like two years ago Mm -hmm. and how much it's changed since then. And you walk out into this, not understanding the way anything works and often with no support system at all. Mm -hmm. Um, Many people's families have turned away from them. That happened to a certain degree with Stefan. And depending on the nature of your crime, especially for him, because it was a violent crime of which he was convicted. There are many people who, despite the way that we say as a culture, we believe in second chances, particularly if someone did something when he was very young. In practice, we don't really believe Mm -hmm. in second chances. We don't act on that. And Jill, who is Belinda's mother, Belinda's the woman who was killed, her mother's rallied the town to protest not only his return, but she's created an organization to be her rallying cry. And I don't remember what the organization is called, but it's really about this. It's it's called SAY, S-A-Y, Stop Abuse Young. Mm -hmm. And it's a worthy organization. I wish there really was one Mm -hmm. because dating violence and dating abuse is a topic that is at the sort of level that domestic abuse was generations ago. People are not really paying attention to the sort of uh, violence that young women in high school and college can suffer at the hands of the, the boys who say they love them. And they don't really have the experience of an adult woman either to understand that a shove really is never love, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so I think that Jill's organization um, really would be a great organization and her passion uh, was, was not misplaced. Mm -hmm. It, it was formed out of her, her enormous grief and bitterness to which she had a right uh, towards Stefan whom she had once loved and, and considered a, a, a part of her family, if you will, because he was Belinda's boyfriend. And, um, and it's, it's, it's sharpened into this, into this weapon that she uses against people. But again, she's someone also with whom I have enormous empathy, sympathy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I have yeah. five sons. I know what it, I don't know, Kinahura. I mean, I, I wish, I hope never to know what it's like to lose a child or to have a child do the worst possible thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But I can imagine. And Jill was a really close friend of Thea's, maybe before they were killed. They were really good friends. So one of her rocks of support, Thea's rocks of support is gone as this is happening as well. And here, I feel like you're also exploring the bonds of women's friendship and what can shatter them and what can hold them together. And I think a lot of that is coming across in the book as well as who sticks with you and who has to walk away from you. <clears throat> Truly, it, um, it would be natural, it would be unnatural if their bond had lasted. Mm-hmm. But in other cases, it seems at the beginning that even Stefan's aunties and his grandma they have doubts about him. They don't know whether they're, they should fear him or not. Ultimately, they come through for him uh, in some ways, but in other ways, the relationships are, are changed forever. Mm-hmm. And people in the community who saw him grow up, now he's a monster to them mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. they can't accept him back. You know, Chris and Hannah describe The Good Son as a compelling novel about the aftermath of a crime in a small, close-knit community. And the idea of this taking place in a small community is different than taking place in a big city or even a large town where you don't know everybody. But the way this town is built, everybody's in and out of each other's lives. If it's the Friday night football game, it's this and that and the other thing. And you think about all the characters and what the reactions might be. And I think that you take us on this 360 view of what's going on instead of just seeing it through their eyes. I wanted the 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 parents, I wanted Jep and Thea to be people who had enjoyed considerable esteem mm-hmm. and friendship within the, she's a college teacher. He's the football, football coach, you know, of a, uh, of a team at a smaller college, but his team that has really had some chops and 
so they are people who you would greet in the community and want to be among your friends. And suddenly they're completely frozen. Mm -hmm. It's as if they're surrounded by a wall of ice that they can see through, but never get out of because of Stefan's actions. And there is no small amount of confused feelings that Thea has about that. Mm -hmm. I mean, she loves her son and she's committed to seeing him to the life after um, prison, but also there's an enormous amount of resentment that she feels toward him because he has torpedoed her good life. Mm -hmm. She had an expectation that her life would be, she would have moderate good fortune. She had worked hard for it. She had earned her doctorate. She had uh, struggled up, you know, in this immigrant Greek family that she comes from and, uh, and made good and now, um, because of her kids' actions, because of his obsession with the girl, her, uh, her life is dimmed. The light under her life is turned out. Oh, yeah. And it's like, okay, what's, you know, what's going to happen now? And at one point, Stefan says, I want to go visit her grave. And Thea's like at this moment of, oh my gosh, like what is going to happen if we go there? And she's torn about supporting him doing this. She's torn about, do we go? And it's one of the big scenes in the book, because it's like, do we buy flowers? Do we leave them? What if we run into her mother? Do we have to hide there because other people might know that we're there? And it, I have heard you tell the story about like, you know, what happened when you, well, the woman was felt like she was going to go see the other mother, which it definitely inspired this, but it's this feeling of tension that's completely building as, as they walk up the hill of what is going to happen when they get there. You bet. And in fact, because of the notoriety of Stefan's crime, the other people who are there are, um, they've seen his face on TV. They know that he was coming out. They know that the house is being picketed. This has been on not just local TV, but because of the issue and because it's a nationwide organization that Jim started, uh, that Joe McCormick started, it's been on national TV. So when he turns up there, it's almost as if he's some sort of uh, character from a TV show and everybody wants to see him. And naturally Thea notices that more than Stefan does. He's mm -hmm. focused on laying roses at the grave. She's focused on what's gonna, is someone gonna try to hurt him? Mm -hmm. Because he's been, there's a, a real social media role in this book. Social yeah. media plays a part in this book. And on through social media and texting and things like that, He's been receiving death threats. And so Thea doesn't know when is anything like that going to be acted upon. Yeah. And it's, and we're, the book is written in this first person narrative that gives us firmly in Thea's head. Like we're there, we're inside what she's thinking and what she's doing. Did you always know it was going to be a first person narrative or is that something you played with along the way? I always knew that this one would be in first person. Not all my books are, but because of the quality of, obsession, if you will, and because of the claustrophobia of the way that Thea feels her life is operating. She doesn't even really know what happened the night that Belinda died. And for her to start to reach out and even try to figure that out for herself, to get the police reports, to find out more about what really went on that night in Belinda's apartment is for her to step out of that clenched position, that claustrophobic and self-protective position that she's been in in the five years since Belinda died. Mm -hmm. So yes, I wanted it to be created very, very close to the bone. Yeah, and there's always, he doesn't know what really happened that night. He was drunk, he was drugged. He doesn't really know what's going on, but he's been convicted. Like this is what he's been told that he did. You know, years ago, I read Sue Klebold's book, A Mother's Reckoning, about her son, Dylan. And I thought it was an amazing book. I mean, I was completely, you know, drawn into the story. He was one of the students who was responsible for the shooting at Columbine, and he died by suicide. And I found her book very, very moving. And later, I watched her TED Talk, and she took responsibility for most likely missing things with her son in his mental health, but also talked about how painful it was to live in the same community. Did you ever read her book or hear her speak? Because I, she's just, when you hear her talk, it's just, whoa, like this is a person. This is the person mm -hmm. who killed all the people. 
You bet I did. And I was galvanized by it. And it was one of the inspirations for this, um, for this story. Wow. When I heard her TED talk and I saw her speak, I was most taken, well, by several parts of it, but in part by her saying, I still love my son. Mm -hmm. nothing will ever change the fact that I love him. And while I may have missed things, I was a good mother. Mm -hmm. I understood myself as a good mother. I understood him. Sure. You know, at 17, he was bitter and withdrawn sometimes. And he was into some things that I didn't like what 17 year old isn't. Mm -hmm. And she didn't notice the difference. And if nothing would have happened and Dylan Klebold had grown up to be a man and uh, and gotten past that period in his life, then no one would be thinking about it. But she refused to say, yes, uh, we just figured that, you know, he we were deliberately ignoring everything and we just figured that he would turn out to be a murderer. Um, she was she talked about the child he had been. Mm -hmm. And how, like in the rings of a tree, that child was still cached inside of the uh, of the killer that he became. Mm -hmm. And I thought about that often mm -hmm. as I was writing this story about how Thea's about how the lover, the love of a mother for a child, particularly a mother, I think. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's fair and maybe it isn't. OK, mm -hmm. but because the the mother in a family is sort of the arbiter of civilization uh, and the, the arbiter of teaching uh, for a child. So often when a child does wrong, the blame is laid at the foot of the mother. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that was certainly true for Sue Klebold and for Thea. Yeah. Yeah. And when Sue was talking, you picture her almost going through the baby albums, like looking at her son, like through the years, with young pictures of him and stuff like that. And what it must feel like to see, like, you've got these other pictures of your son that are drawn by others at this point, Wor worldwide, worldwide, this is who your son is. Right. Mm -hmm. And the guilt and the grief and the shame, all of those are entirely real, but so is the love. Mm -hmm. A mother's love is transcendent and everlasting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Story was just, the, the book was just so beautifully done. It's one of those books that you remember afterwards. Like I'm going to remember this book because it's the story is just like right there in your face. And it's like, it's unflinching when you're sitting, when you're talking about how Thea feels, when you're talking how Stefan feels. It's like right there on the page, there's no hiding it. And I think that's one of the things that makes it so strong. The book is also propelled like a thriller because we really don't know what happens. And the pacing of the book has a lot of the pacing of a thriller because there is that question that keeps coming up. It's like snapping here, like, okay, what's really happening? She's getting some messages. She's trying to figure out what's going on. And have you ever, were you thinking about the pacing? Were you thinking about that rolling as you were going through? Because it, it seems different from other books you've done. It is, it is. And that was, yes, that was entirely deliberate. Uh, my buddy, Scott Giroux, who wrote one of the quotes for the book said that he thought when he when it opened up it was going to be a meditation on the hardships of family and the way that a young offender would re-enter the community and suddenly he was he said suddenly I was saying hey what's going on here what really did happen who you know what's uh, who's on first and I did want it to go that way I wanted you to keep wondering you the reader to keep wondering until the end, what role does that little girl play that keeps writing to her? And who's the who's the guy that broke into their house and and drew uh, uh, dark circles over all the eyes and all the pictures, which is the creepiest scene I've ever made up. Oh, it's so creepy. Um, and and then didn't steal anything or did, do anything else. It um, I wanted it to to be something that was not only exciting and not only provoking emotion, but also troubling in a way mm -hmm. and disturbing, something you would think about when the lights were out. Well, especially if somebody's ever broken into your home. Once that's happened, that went to my parents years ago and I could still feel when they called me and told me what had happened and how it gone on. And it's just terrifying that somebody violated you like that. Somebody just did that. And somebody can enjoy drawing circles on the eyes. It's like, whoa, watching me, wanting to knock my eyes out. What is the feeling that's gonna come out here and what's going on in this girl? So it, it definitely had this 
thriller kind of a pace as I was reading. And I was like, oh, Jacqueline Bouchard's in a new direction. You know, it's like writing's in a new direction. And I do want to keep, you know, I often say, oh, great spirit, send me a continuing character. And the great spirit says, nah. <laughs> so a lot of my books, almost every one of them, there's only one that has a sequel. Mm -hmm. And most of my books are standalone books in which mm -hmm. all of the action and redemption takes place in between the two covers, the whole life is there. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing that comes afterward. So I want to be able to um, each time challenge myself and make the book harder for me to write and therefore more satisfying to the reader. Mm -hmm. And I want there to be not just emotions, but though emotions and the authenticity of emotion is really important in a book, I want stuff to happen too. Mm -hmm. I want there to be incident and people, that's why my newsletter um, that I just started uh, a couple of months ago from my website, is called the gasp because <laughs> I I want readers to to get to a certain point of the book and go oh that's why that happened you know because to to me those are the most exciting and satisfying parts of stories yeah and and there are three parts of the book which really tie into that because it's release renewal and redemption three R words and I went back and looked at those and it's funny it folded down those pages because I was like hmm that's going to be something later on so splitting the book like that what were you telling saying and that I take it that came later or no that did come later that mm -hmm. was in fact not even my doing that was the idea of my uh the combination of my editor and my agent together uh dividing the book into phases. One important part of the middle passage of that book was Stefan forming the organization called The Healing Project, which would try to uh, not just, uh, there's a forgiveness project in real life. I also wish there was a real healing project because it, um, it was an idea that people who had been offenders would try to make restitution in some material way one guy, for example, starting um, a college fund for the daughters of a, a woman he had murdered when he was in a drunk driving accident, killed in a drunk driving accident, that would be some way that people could materially provide for the people who were left behind by their and affected by their crimes. Mm -hmm. And so that gave that was the wind beneath his wings that gave him a reason to go on when he couldn't see any other reason to go on was the power of this project that he was involved in because he felt such enormous guilt and culpability that serving in prison wasn't anywhere near enough. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, he's seeing he can help others by doing this as well. And you're also seeing who you've seen a lot of who this kid was before he went to jail, mm -hmm. because you don't if you you don't come out and do something like that. If you didn't have background back here, it's not like you automatically say, oh, let me go out and figure out a way to help others and heal. There was something you saw really good in him when you got to that part of the book. That was one of the parts of the book that people criticized negatively most. Um, uh, vocally, because mm -hmm. they said most people who go to prison don't come out and try to do good. And but he wasn't most people. Mm -mm. I mean, he was front loaded to try to do good in his life mm -hmm. uh, before this happened. And certainly it was believable what he did because he was sidetracked in his life by his blinding love for this girl which became everything to him. So mm -hmm. in some ways, this, um, this is also a story about obsession mm -hmm. and how people become fixed on one idea. And um, each of them, you know, even the uh, secondary characters like Rebecca um, become fixed on this one idea of what they should, uh, what they should do, should have done in their lives mm -hmm. and what they still could do to make amends. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and it's like, you know, his background was different from a lot of other people. I think when people sure. are saying oh, that wouldn't happen, well, 
He didn't come from the background where his father was the coach helping kids and his mother was in a position of helping kids all day. And that was the dinner table conversation. So he was in a different place he from an, you know, an educated place. So what's your writing process up? Do you start with an outline? Do you do this messy first draft? Do you just throw it all down? What's it like? No, I am the only one who does not do the messy first draft. I write it in the order it's going to be from the first sentence, right marching through to the end, don't write down anything else. I make notes for what's going to come later. Mm -hmm. I mean, and but when I'm in a writing day, I'm saying to myself, okay, I'm going to write up to the point where she and Julie go to the cabin to go skiing. I'm going now today, I'm going to write up to the point where she meets the detective, uh, where Thea meets the detective, and then I'm going to stop. And so I know in a general way what's going to happen. And until the part that I have finished is to my liking is perfect on the page, I won't go on to the next part. Mm -hmm. Now, when the editor gets it, when the editor gets the, uh, well, first when my agent gets it, and then when the editor gets it, they say, no, that guy should not have been a priest. He should have been a polo player. Don't you know that? Go back and fix that. Check out chapter 22. Nothing's going on there except people talking. No one wants to hear that. So there's a great deal of revision that goes on after I think it's as good as I can make it. But that's mm -hmm. why you have editors. Right. And that's why people who, I mean, people who self-publish their books, they do it at their own peril mm -hmm. because there's no gatekeeper. Mm -mm. And the way that you feel about something, you may feel that it's, you know, I mean, there are a lot of bad marriages built on this. You may feel that, the, that it's all jello and pudding, but when someone else comes along and looks at it and says, mm, no, that's not working out. Uh, you, you, uh, when an editor says that to you, you take to your bed, you pull your covers up and cry, and then you get up and do what needs to be done. <laughs> Lynn Barkley's got a great line about waiting for revisions. He said, it's like waiting for tests from the doctor. Is the result good or bad? Is it benign or malignant? Like, am I going to die or am I going to live? He said, because you're just laying there with the whole thing that you've put everything you think onto the page. And then sometimes he says, well, he didn't say this, but people say, oh, wow, that's like opening another door for me that I never saw because I wrote it in my head. And now, yeah, maybe that's going to work out. Or I'm going to stand and fight exactly for the page the way I want it. You know, it goes both ways. 90% of the time, the editor is right. And 90% in that medical image that you put forth, they're saying like, well, if you have the surgery and you get better, then you'll probably go on and live a long life. But mm -hmm. you, it, there's, there's definitely surgery indicated here. So our and, medicine. And the incisions either be long or short, you got to figure out what you're going to do. Right. When you right. say you're trying to get the page right, I'd like you to, so when you're writing, you're, okay, you've got that first paragraph, those first couple of sentences are real tight. And you keep going down the page. Do you go back then and keep doing the pages back, doing one from five over again, page one through five, then do one through 10 and just keep doing it over and over? Right. I, it's it's um, four steps forward, one step back, three steps mm -hmm. forward, two steps back. It It is a forward progress, but not at all a free fall toward mm -hmm. the end. Mm -hmm. Everyone else I know, every other good writer who I know does a draft first mm -hmm. and then goes back and starts to repair and sharpen and put in the beautiful imagery and things like that. And I won't, if I can't, if I, uh, one of the things that I have most trouble with as a writer is similes, mm -hmm. you know, he was as whatever, you know, cool as a cucumber or avoiding something like cool as a cucumber. Um, and if I can't think of the simile, I mean, I will work for hours, for three hours on one sentence. Wow. You won't leave just, just blank, come back. No. Nope. No. No, because that would be, I would make myself crazy. I would be walking around the room just thinking only about that. And, uh, and nothing else will make, would make any uh, sense to me. When I'm writing a book, I really only work on it like pure writing, mm -hmm. maybe three or four hours a day. Okay. Um, and then I do other things, but maybe three hours before I start to get stupid mm -hmm. and make mistakes. 
Mm -hmm. or think I'm really great. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, it's, uh, it's a shame. Um, but I, I can't write through the, I'm a morning person. I get up and I start to do this after I have my tea or my coffee and then go forward. But, um, but after a certain length of time, I know that I'm in danger of being too easy on myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've just got to sit there and pull back. Pull right. Back. Yeah. And always as, as Ernest Hemingway famously said, you know, you leave with something left to say. Mm -hmm. you don't so you'll go back the next day yeah something so to pick up instead it. of yep. instead of blank it's like oh uh, I think they're not used to nothing be as bad as when the computer first came out and word would just have that light blinking at you like put yeah. something on the page that's terrifying because I was like I have nothing like I have nothing I'm doing something I have absolutely nothing I was writing a paper at school whatever I have nothing you know so those kinds of feelings so was the title always the good son no um, in fact, the title is not my favorite title. Mm. I, I very much the title because Stefan was an only child and because Belinda was an only child and to their parents, they were the suns in the sky, you know, the stars in the sky. It, um, it was originally called my only, mm. a title that I loved and everybody else said, eh. Um, but I was thinking of that old, old song. I think it's by the platters, maybe like from, this is before I was born. Um, my one and only you, you're my dream come true. My one and only you. Yeah. And that's the way parents feel about their children, particularly only children, all their apples are in one basket. And so that was the original title. And then there were 35 more titles that I wrote down. <laughs> none of which um, my uh, publisher liked. Mm -hmm. And so there you have it. There you have it. And then they said one day, it's going to be called A Good Son. That's going yep. to be You know, yep. it, I have to say that this book had really terrific about the book copy, like written about it. As I said, we were previewing it to readers. I was previewing it to library events that I was doing, like, you know, many of them. And it had this copy that was completely engaging on what was going to happen. So now I want to talk about the cover because to me, I said, I've been trying to figure the cover out. I've been trying okay. to figure out that specifically the apples and I'm trying to nail the meaning about it. So I'm going to go with, I see one large bruised apple up here that's on a branch that's alone. And then I'm seeing the other over here. Okay. So tell me what I'm missing or what I well, got. Well, right. you're not missing anything. Literally, it is literally a representative of the apple tree they planted in the yard when he was born. And it's the first thing he sees when they come around the corner onto Washtenaw Street where they live uh, in the small town is how much bigger the apple tree has gotten. Mm -hmm. And that he used to climb out when he was six years old, he would climb out the window and, um, and climb down the tree into the front yard. Uh, when he's, when uh, in the rendering, it's supposed to mean that both, that either that he's the bad apple Mm -hmm. or that he's been harmed, a mm -hmm. bruise apple, mm -hmm. so or maybe both. Mm -hmm. And so that's what it's supposed to mean. And it also is, the colors of it are a direct ripoff of Ann Patchett's book, um, Commonwealth, oh, which right, is one right, of my right. favorite books. And I loved the cover of that. I just love that teal and green and red colors. Teal is my favorite color. So teal turquoise, like I'm in, I'm totally yeah. in. Yeah. And what I also saw is this one was on a branch by itself. And it was like, sort of like support. It was like the one that was supposed to drop first. It was going to be the one that was going to get picked first I was seeing. And then these down here were more supported. So that was my like total over-interpretation of the book. Totally. No, it, they, um, the whole fruit tree thing, they were going to, when they, if they had another child, they wanted to plant a pear tree. And then maybe a cherry tree for a little girl or another little boy, but they only got the one. Mm -hmm. And so all of their apples are on one, you know, on one mm -hmm. tree. One, the one basket, all the apples in one basket. How about the audio book? Did you have a hand in picking the narrator? Nope. No. You didn't. <laughs> nope. nope. No, they gave me thing. a choice of three people and each of them was reading for about 30 seconds. And I said, those are swell. <laughs> go for um, it yeah 
<laughs> See who's and great. I don't, I've never had the option other than for a book of essays that I wrote one time a hundred years ago of, of doing any of the reading myself. I have a really strong accent, mm -hmm. a Chicago accent. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so it doesn't really translate into that. What we're used to hearing book narrators use is called mid Atlantic. Okay. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. And it's the kind of English that you hear a news broadcaster mm -hmm. speak. Um, they don't usually have um, a strong regional accent. Mm -hmm. So no, I had nothing to do with that. And pick, they, here's one, here are three. Yep. They sound good. Okay. Yeah. They sound three. fine. Yeah. Pick one. I don't like to mix in too much to mm -hmm. tell the truth. Mm -hmm. I don't like to know what position the book is on Amazon. I'm not a stock checker. I don't want to do anything to make me crazy. Mm -hmm. I'm crazy Smart. enough as Smart. it is. Yeah. No, because crazy. otherwise I just, Oh, you know, what can I do? No, people obsess. They obsess how many Goodreads reviews they've gotten, what percentage of Goodreads. And we don't even know who these people are that are doing. You don't know if they're like you. You don't know if they like the same kind of books you like. You don't know anything. And I'm always amazed when I'm on like Facebook pages and it's a book page where everybody's talking about books. What is your favorite book? Like, what do you, should I read next? And I'm like, really? You're asking like these total strangers that are going to write down something and from what you're saying up there, they're supposed to figure out what you're supposed to read next. I just find it fascinating that that, and it happens every day, you know? Who's the famous romance writer? Really famous romance oh, writer. Yeah, uh, exactly. You know who I mean. Yes, I know she exactly. has lots and lots of children. Yes, um, Danielle Seal. Right. right, okay. I think it was Kristen Hanna one time who told me that when she read, uh, she read a, um, an Amazon review that said, my two favorite writers are Kristen Hanna and Danielle Steele. And, you know, she thought, what does that even mean? You know, <laughs> what, what do we, hmm, what do we have in common? What is it, and, common? Um, <laughs> it makes you doubt yourself in every possible kind of way. Or you look at an Amazon review, which I, I mean, I only read my bad reviews and I'll, I'll tell you why. Um, but it, the I look on Amazon reviews and it's like one star. So I look at that one and it says, I really hated the color of the type in this book. <laughs> it isn't even anything about the book. It's like when you buy pudding on Amazon and they say that's one star and you think, oh my goodness. And you look at it and it says, this didn't come for two weeks. It had nothing <laughs> to do with the pudding. Um, right. So uh, I only read my bad reviews because there's always something I can learn from them. Yeah. And it is, it's and like, wait a second, what are they taking away from the book that they, what did they miss? What did they right. miss that I was trying well, to convey? Yeah. What did I fail to convey? Right. What did I, I do it. too much of? Yeah. Or too little of? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and those reviews are more instructive for the next book than the ones that say, oh, this was fine. Mm -hmm. But you also have to sit there and say what mood you are in when you read a book. Are you racing through it? Are you reading it for book group? Like, what are you doing? Are you in the right frame of mind to be reading The Good Son? Are you in the right frame of mind? There was a book that came out last fall. I will not use the title of it. I was not in the mood to read that book. I read part of the book and then I got to the second part and I didn't want to read that book anymore. I actually kind of threw the book. And it was really interesting because that's usually not me. But I realized I was just not in the frame of mind to go for that. Like I wasn't going to go there. And I stopped. I said, I just don't want to finish this. I don't want to do it. And that's unusual. But a lot of times it's what are you in the mood for reading or really when you sit down to do it? And, and it it's not entirely fair to the writer. I have a policy that I finish every book I start. Oh, you're good. OK. And because I know how hard it is to write anything. Mm -hmm. But recently I've really been tested with that mm -hmm. policy because mm -hmm. I've had books that I've even purchased that I just don't want to fit. No, because sometimes it's just, I don't know. I just have a different, uh, it's like, oh, you know, like I'm going to read this because I should be reading because I want to do an interview. And all of a sudden I'm completely captivated, completely captivated by the book. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be a wonderful experience. You know, some books start slowly mm -hmm. and you have to, but but I don't believe uh, I can remember reviews of a much lauded book, and I won't use the name of it either. Yes, I will. Memoirs of a Geisha mm -hmm. was the Geisha. I mean, Memoirs of a Geisha was the book. And people said, 
you, you're going to love this if you can just read the first 75 pages, get mm-hmm. through them. Mm-hmm. And to me, that was a long time ago. And it was a wonderful book. But also, 75 pages is a lot of pages. Mm-hmm. A That's lot of a big time, time commitment mm-hmm. to ask someone to make mm-hmm. and to ask someone to, when you write a book, It's like you're inviting someone to the dance. You know, you're saying, take my hand, trust me, I'm going to make this worth your while. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to trip over the person's feet and step on their toes for the first 15 minutes, by that time, you're going to have extinguished a a lot of that person's goodwill Mm -hmm. toward you and toward the story. Mm -hmm. So I don't believe that it has to start out necessarily with a car chase or you know, an apocalyptic event, uh, but it does have to start out with something that immediately engages. Mm -hmm. Well, I also feel that because the rest of media that we're with these days, whether it's the news, whether it's watching whatever is on every streaming channel possible, you're in it in three seconds. You're not, it's not a slow burn to get into these stories. It's you're in it in the first five, 10 minutes. So I think we've been trained to expect even a bigger delivery when we start to read a book. We're, we're, we're trained that it's going to be something huge. It's not going to like, yes, you would start, but you've got to have good language. You've got to have something propelling the story forward just because of what everybody's used to having around them. Further, a book is only one kind of stimulus. I mean, you create the images and the pictures in your head, but you're, you're reading it with your, your brain you're not, you don't have a picture or a soundtrack or a laugh track or any other kind of stimulus that guides you into how you're supposed to feel about it. Mm -hmm. So the reader or the writer needs to create for the reader. It's an enormous responsibility to create that world and to invite the reader to come in it and stay for a while. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be a book that you're going to pick up and put down, or is it going to be the one where you sit on the couch, put the fire in the fireplace, and you don't move all day? And you'll have a different reaction of reading a book if you just get to sit down and go all the way through instead of stop, start, stop, start, you know? And it's just as it, what's going to happen for you. And so, for most people, it is that time before they go to sleep at night. Mm-hmm, it's their mm-hmm. little treat, you mm-hmm. know, that, that chapter or... Uh, those few pages before you go to sleep at night that you're cozied up with your with your tea or your snack and your book um, is uh, is the place at which. So I believe that even if you have something important to say in a book, that it's like a bran muffin. Okay, bran muffins are good and they're Mm -hmm. good for you. Right. But you have to have those raisins in order to get people to get through it. You have to have a little bit of raisins and some cinnamon in order for them to take in the lessons and thoughts and emotions you want them to understand. I'm going to send you my brand recipe, my <laughs> brand muffin recipe. It has, it has a cup of fruits in it. It has all the stuff. There's oh, orange juice in it. I'm serious. <laughs> and I'm telling you, I love them. My husband says, and the thing is with brand muffins, you have to undercook them. Because it's like cereal, you can't, it's, it's a minute or two before they get too hard and they're kind of like just not great for the whole week. I usually make them every week. I make them on a Saturday or Sunday and then he kind of rates them as the week goes on. Like, ah, that one's not so good. Ah, that one's, you know. Oh, you, he's a lucky man <laughs> that you're making bran muffins for him and, and thinking of his heart health and his joy. Just so going, oh, this is a girl. No, he said they're really good. It's, I think it's all the fruit I put in them. They're probably 9 million calories of sugar, but whatever, you know? No, I mean, it, we need, we need treats uh, mm-hmm. in our reading. We need mm-hmm. treats. We need something to pay for a book. Let's face it, you know, to pay for a book and to stay with it for the whole 350 or 400 pages. That's an adventure. Yeah. And it's, it's a time commitment in lives that are being claimed and pulled in lots of different directions. So you do need your raisins and your dried fruit. 
Yeah, you definitely need, you definitely need to like, you know, break things up. The other thing I realized too, is I'm reading Alison Pataki's new book and I'm absolutely loving it, but I do realize that every night just before I fall asleep, before I close the book, those last two pages, I'm really not registering the way I should. And I always open it up and go, huh? And I go back two pages. I'm like, oh, that's where I really left off. I kept reading, but I was not really, I was reading, but not focusing. And I noticed that now about myself, it's about two pages. Don't have to go back much more, but it's two, you know? I don't know if it's a sign of age or what's going on. No, I'm still 27. Let's get real. No, I think that everybody is like that. Those last things as you slide toward your own oblivion, those last things uh, don't really register. That's why people fall asleep with books open on their faces. <laughs> Here it is right beside me, right beside me. So you had the amazing honor of being the first book that Oprah chose years ago with the deep end of the ocean. And I'm trying to remember, was that 1996 or 97? It was right around the time we started the company. And that's how I remember it. It was right. It was the end of 96. And it uh, was a, boy, talk about, it was stunning, but no one thought it would be. Mm-hmm. Even my publisher, my publisher, when I, when, uh, I told uh, the publisher that Oprah Winfrey had called me and she was going to start the world's largest book club with my book. They said, well, don't, you know, don't put too much faith in that because, you know, people who watch daytime TV are not readers. <laughs> okay. Well, by that night, by the time she announced the book club, uh, by that evening, there were 4,000 holds on the book at the New York Public Library. Wow. 4,000 wow. people had reserved it to read. So wrong about that. And it, it, uh, it had a stunning effect on the, the future of the book. And it was very exciting to see the hunger and thirst that people had for gossiping about books. Mm-hmm. And that's what books are for. Mm-hmm. They're for gossiping about. Gossiping, that's the reason book clubs work. Because it's, you're yep. going to go gossip and chat about the book and you're going to gossip about life. But that's exactly right. And you're saying to your friends in the book club, oh, I don't believe that she really would have done that. No, I think he was a good husband. I can remember one of the most moving things that happened to me. I was in a pizza restaurant with my kids at the time that uh, the book had just been published. And there was a girl there. She couldn't have been more than 16. Little, beautiful little girl, Hispanic girl, had a little baby in a pouch on her uh, front, little tiny baby. And she was standing there and she tur- I turned around, she turned around. And I was thinking while I was watching, I was thinking, oh, honey, you know, you're too young to have that baby. Mm-hmm. And you made this choice and God bless you. She turned around and she was holding the deep end of the ocean and reading it. Wow. Wow. And I thought, what a witness to me and what a, what a butthole I could be. Mm-hmm. I was so, uh, I was so excited then to think that, I mean, maybe it's not the best book in the world, but she was in there and she was, you know, taking over Winfrey's recommendation and reading that book and was, um, was that much better of a woman and that much better of a mother for doing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. She's reading exploring life looking at the all story. you need to do is read it will always yeah. save you you it will, you can never be a prisoner even in your own body or in your own circumstances if you have a book yeah it's like if, if this is what you're doing there's that woman on um, that book inventing anna or that star show inventing anna that's on um netflix right now she was the woman who swindled everybody in new york out of money all this time mm-hmm. and she said that she can't read hardcover books in prison she can only read paperbacks which I thought was a really interesting point. And she said, there was something they said, have you read it? And she goes, no, I can only read paperbacks. So interesting thing that happens in prison. I just remember it happened, your book happened about the time we were launching. We launched in August, 1996. I remember right. going, oh, this is like really cool thing. We need to go find her and talk to her. We need, at the time where an interview was like typing for each other, it was really quite funny. It was, that was your first book though, right? Was the first that book? was my first now, yeah, my first, first book. Novel. And yeah. Um, I never imagined by the time I finished writing that book, I was a young widow. I was in my late thirties. My husband had died. I had three little boys. I started writing that book in order to prove to myself that I could do something that I knew was impossible for Mm -hmm. me. I had been a newspaper reporter, so I knew how to write a sentence, you know, but I, I didn't know how to write a novel. 
And when I finished it, I knew it was good enough that it would be published. I never imagined, you know, it would, it would be happen. Yeah. 3 million copies and 34 languages and all that jazz. It's still sort of a giggle to me because it, it, I never imagined living uh, the life of a person who got to write stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like, yeah, you don't have to write on these deadlines the same way you're writing for newspapers. It's instead write what you're feeling, write what you want to do. Kind of. Kinda. Nice. <laughs> kind of, kind of you nice. really have to provide uh, these days in order for a book to receive a good publication and for them to put some resources behind it. You really have to let them know what it's going to be, though, mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. you start to write it. Mm -hmm. I have had to write a bullet point outline and a precy for every book that I've written for the past 15 years because they really want to know where it's going to go. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. whether how it's going to be different from something else. Mm -hmm. And I guess that's probably a good idea because I don't want to read another book in which it's the story is disappointed in love. Victoria goes back to the island community where she grew up and the and meets the boy who's now a veterinarian who she grew up with. I don't want to read that book again. Mm -hmm. um, I know what's going to happen. And uh, I want to read something that is, has, there's nothing new under the sun, really, but I want to read a story that has a bit of a freshened plot. Mm -hmm. we, we read The Paper Palace with our group this summer. At the end, it's got its ending that you don't know what happened. We were taking votes on how we thought the book ended. And I really thought everybody was going to see it my way, and they didn't. And it was so interesting. So then one of our readers said, she read it with her book club and she's one of the person people thought that they, the person killed herself. And it, two people thought it in the group, she says, that never crossed my mind. And then we're back to our group and they go, yeah, remember one person thought that here too. So it's interesting when you get together and you discuss a book because you only have your frame of reference when you finished it. It's only you. Sure, sure. And, and it's you know, very, it's as important how you end a book as how you begin it. Because what, what people, even writers sometimes fail to realize is that the end of the, you know how hard it is when you end it, you don't want to end the book because right. you know there's never going to be another book that you're going to be, even be interested in, much less like as much as this. So you get to the end of the book and for the reader, you have to be mindful of the fact that this is not just the end of the book, it's the beginning of the world without the book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you have to be careful how you restore that person to the world and make sure that it's going to be okay for the reader. Mm -hmm. Okay, you gotta take it a little bit full circle and get you out, yeah. get, you, yeah. get you out of what's going on. So with that in mind, what's next for you? Are you well, I'm writing, I uh, just started writing a new book. I'm about 90 pages into it, uh, stop and start, stop and start. Um, and it is about a young woman who is an underwater photographer an acclaimed, like, you know, like David Dublier or something, uh, who takes pictures of underwater creatures, who comes back to Cape Cod to see her widowed father a year after her mother's death, because the girl, the, I call her a girl advisedly, she's 27, and she has just, she's going to have a baby and she's getting married. She never thought she would settle down. She comes back to Cape Cod. And her father, to see her father and her best friend, and uh, her father announces that they're getting married. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and that's just the start of it. That's just the and start the best of it. best friend is also pregnant. Wow. So, yeah. so I thought um, something like that happened actually to me in, um, in my earlier life in a strange way. And I thought, what would it be like to have that in a story and then have it go on from there with complication after complication? But uh, I wanted it to open with something that would make people have exactly the reaction you had. It's cold oh, open. <laughs> yeah, wow, yuck. <laughs> I'm going to tell my friends right in Hollywood, if they've ever got trouble with a cold open, call you. Because you know how in Hollywood, they don't they, they do not do the whole thing. Like as Dennis Lane says, I'm only doing the woodwork. Somebody says, I'm only doing the walls. You can yeah. just do the cold opens. You'll just work on the cold opens for everybody. <laughs> That's right. It's called right now, and I hope it will keep this title. Hello, Mira Harper Collins, 
um, it's called salt water because that's the ocean, but it's also our blood and our tears, you know? Yeah. And the salt water though is also what heals wounds. It's also what heals wounds, but it can also really hurt when it's going on top of the wound. Right. Erect your hair as well. I'm voting for salt. I'm voting for salt water. Thank you very much. Yes. Yes. I'd have to finish it and then I'll see if it's still salt water. Okay. (laughs) Look, this has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. A really pleasure. I really appreciate it. I really had a lot of fun. Lots of laughs. Thank you so much. Thank you, Austin. And to our readers, look forward to seeing you next time on Book Reporter Talks to. Don't forget to follow us on YouTube, sign up to follow us and listen to us wherever podcasts, wherever you're listening to them. Thanks so much for joining us, everyone.